Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order the August uh, meeting of the Delaware County Juvenile Attention Board. Um, would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carlson, do you want to come to the table since we've got extra seats? It's helpful. Um, I'd like to announce a couple of things. One, we have virtually uh, today, we have Chris Eiserman, um, Councilwoman Schaefer, Vice Chair Murray Williams. And is there anyone else from the board that's on via Zoom that I didn't mention? All right. Um, I'd also like to make note that we had a uh, executive session yesterday to cover um, matters of public safety in nature. Um, next is our first round of public comment. So as always, the first round of public comment is for items that are only on the agenda. Um, and at the end of the meeting, there will also be another round that can be regarding anything related to juvenile detention. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? Hearing none. Um, next item is an approval of the minutes from July. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Your Honor. Second? Second. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Please roll eyes. Any nays? The motion passes. Um, next item for today is the monthly detained youth report from Juvenile Court and Probation Services. We have Ms. DiMatteo. Good evening, Danielle DiMatteo from Juvenile Court and Probation Services. Uh, currently we have three males in detention, uh, one at Abraxas Academy, one in Central County's Youth Center, one at Bucks County's Youth Center. We have four um, interest of justice matters, um, one in Philadelphia, um, two in Morgantown, Abraxas, sorry, three that are in custody. Okay. Any questions for Ms. DiMatteo from board members? All right, thank you, Ms. DiMatteo. Thank you. Next, we have our Superintendent of Juvenile Justice Services, Mr. Rosari, with your reports. Good afternoon, board. Um, first, I'd like to start the first agenda item. I'd like to update the board on the status of our secure license. Um, so as of August the 12th, I was able to submit via mail an application uh, to relicense uh, the Lama campus. Um, and again, I'll defer back to the board if you have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Rosari? Hearing none. Good. So we'll move on. Uh, so as as you all know, uh, in our February meeting, we were able to develop a sub design committee, which uh, for the past three months we we met on a biweekly basis. Um, and discuss a potential design of what uh, we can reimagine uh, our current campus as. And I kind of want to give an overview of some of the some of the things we talked about um, for the group for the group to kind of digest. As we now have an architect, um, and we all have an understanding um, of what of what we're asking the architect in terms of design. So start from the top. So again, if you look at what our sub, you know, who our subcommittee consists of, is myself, my director Nelson Walker, uh, our co-chair Marie Williams, uh, our board member Reverend James Turner, board member Judge Nathaniel Nichols, uh, our criminal justice director Mike Resnick, our council uh, chair, as well as our board member Dr. Monica Taylor, and our solicitor team Shelley Smith, Carlton Johnson, and our public works director Danielle Floyd. Again, we met bi-weekly. Um, to discuss um, what the program and, uh, would look like, as well as um, some aesthetics of, of, of the building. Next slide, please. Um, so again, it was, it was important for us prior to really discussing a program as well as um, uh, a design is, uh, is 
uh, what we wanted to see collectively yeah. as a group, right? So some common themes that we talked about, number one was the trauma-informed design, right? We, we aim to look uh, more like a school, more like a community center ra rather than a jail. Um, we, we understand we need something durable, safe with plenty of security, uh, but we wanna make sure the feel is less institutional and more familiar. So what we're talking about is more natural lighting, softer colors, clear lines of sight, that transparency piece was very big on us. Um, as well as furnishing, furnishings uh, that make the facility look and feel more like an at-home atmosphere, as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to the current jail look, um, and one that was more conducive to kids, helping them feel safe. And you know, we aim to provide more treatment um, as well as recreation and education. Next slide, please. Another common theme that we all kind of agreed upon was that on-site service delivery piece. I want to make sure that. Uh, services um, are available to treat and really rehabilitate young people who reside there um, with our goal to really trying to steer them away from the judicial system. Um, you know, we want to include specialists in terms of behavioral uh, psychology, chemical dependency, professional counselors, child care staff. Um, again, we aim to be somewhat of a one-stop shop, uh, continuum of prevention, rehabilitation, and reentry services. Next slide, please. And our third kind of theme that we all agreed upon was the ability to make sure we include family and community as partners, right? We want to emphasis on family reunification, community connections. Uh, we want to enable the family and the youth to be able to access the appropriate resources um, so they're prepared for the young people to come home and remain engaged. Thanks. Um, so I think with that being said, um, we understood that with the limited time that we had looking at the data where young people were in uh, detention, uh, we needed a dual purpose facility to really uh, increase the time that we have to spend with young people and ultimately intervene uh, and be helpful. Uh, so when we talked about that dual purpose campus, <clears throat> uh, again, we wanted to look more like, an, we wanted to use an educational uh, campus kind of model for recenter rehabilitation, um, kind of developing that freedom of movement concept. Um, and the idea again is, you know, if we treat young people um, as young, independent, responsible human beings, Obviously, we want to make sure it's a controlled and managed environment, but the more likely that they'll act accordingly increases. Uh, next slide, please. So the first function um, and most important function we talked about in the building is that secure rehabilitative space, right? So we're again, uh, we talked about a minimum of 20 beds. Uh, we want to make sure it reflects best practices in trauma-informed care. Um, we want it to be designed that um, so we can establish that kind of normal day-to-day -day routine, make sure it has a less institutional feeling. Um, some of the services that uh, we're hoping to provide, education, recreation, therapeutic, mental health, food, and health-related services. Um, again, uh, throughout our campus, we really talked about walls being removed and replaced with um, impact-resistant glass, uh, both exterior and interior glass walls. For me, promote transparency, which is big in terms of um, our rebuild. And two, um, there's a lot of important health benefits, uh, including, you know, increasing increasing kids' ability to focus, we're boosting productivity, uh, helping with their sleep patterns as well. Next slide. And anyone, we agree that anywhere in the center where walls must exist, um, that they should be covered with bright, warm, color murals, promoting positivity and uh, inspiring informa uh, affirmations. Again, kind of speaks for itself. Uh, we want anywhere you turn in the building where there's a wall, it's, it's uh, kind of reaffirming young people that um, they can change, they can do it, and they, you know, they can um, turn the leaf. Uh, next, next place, please. So in terms of an addition, some space that we saw in other centers that we thought was very important to bring um, to our center, really just to increase uh, a young person's confidentiality and safety at the center was that enclosed courtyard. If you look at those three pictures there, these are actual centers that I visit. To the far left is uh, Lancaster County, in the middle is Bucks, and to the far right, that's um, Chester County. Again, these are all outdoor spaces that are enclosed within the facility. Most facilities are built in that square kind of rectangle shape, and in the middle um, is where you have that enclosed courtyard. Um, for us, it would it would be you know it would allow us to eliminate the fence. Um, and again, it gives that confidentiality that young people need. They have to be sight and sound separated from the community. Um, and this allows them to do that as well. Next slide, please. So we, again, when we talked uh, some additional spaces that we would like to have seen in our center, 
um, several, at least three additional uh, therapeutic support spaces for young people who are going through crisis. Uh, we were looking at a new medical uh, space. Um, we want to really uh, incorporate a family visitation center, uh, uh, obviously some offices for our staff, uh, an official visitor's lobby. We don't want young, we, we don't want families to walk in and um, immediately see the secure side. We want to have that enclosed. Uh, and it was important to us again for the confidentiality and the safety piece to make sure that we include an enclosed Sally port or garage uh, for our officers who are uh, transporting young people to the center. Um, if you can go back from real quick, Sean. So if you look at the bottom, if you look at that bottom uh, left picture there, um, that is that is a room called a multi-sensory de-escalation room. Sacramento County um, in, Ca in California, uh, in partnership with Georgetown University, created that room. And it was really a room to allow young people to um, kind of go through whatever they're going through. They had a tough day, long day in court, um, really without the use of um, any type of physical restraint, things of that nature. Um, there was, a, the, the, you know, they're able to pretty much measure how they how they felt going in and how they felt uh, leaving. Uh, we thought that was something that was very important, and we'd like to incorporate in our center as well. Um, I think to the far to the far right, um, that was my visit at Stevenson Center. They had um, a fairly big family. Uh, this was in Delaware, Milton, Delaware. It had a fairly big family visitation center. One thing I thought was great within that center was they had a monthly family night where they hosted an event for young people and their families. They were able to sit together, watch a movie, et cetera. That's something that we hope to uh, incorporate in our program as well. Next slide, please. So in, tools, in, in terms of the dual purpose, right, we know that we need that secure side. Um, we also really talked about the ability to work with young people a lot longer. Um, and the other side, which is essentially uh, a community um, resource center um, for name purposes, we just I'm just calling it now family youth community space. Um, but essentially, it's a section of the campus that provides um, designed that's designed to equip young people um, with the needed resources to obviously uh, remain arrest free, prevent them from any future or further involvement in the justice system. Um, we really like to address that out of school time. So we do know that young people are most likely to get in trouble during the times of uh, four, to eight, four to eight or 9 p.m. Um, that's kind of the out of school time. And we want to be able to be able to be uh, function on the weekend as well on Saturdays. Um, again, we want to be able to provide job readiness training, conflict resolution, uh, violence prevention, mentoring, um, any type of family engagement, just structured just structured uh, programming. And the message for us is you don't have to get arrested here in the county in order to receive these services um, at the center. Um, we, have, we have them for young people um, who are not uh, in detention as well. Next slide, please. Uh, some additional spaces we talked about that we kind of want included uh, on that side was uh, a resource center, right? Youth lounges for, for at homework space, uh, mental health center for not only young people, but as well as their families, space for them to eat, a community garden, uh, classrooms for structure programming, uh, computer lab, public event space, indoor outdoor recreation, and of course we want to make sure there's a separate entrance um, to the, to the facility. Next slide. I think our closest case study in terms of this model would be Lancaster County's Youth Intervention Center. Um, I think one one step that we may have over that center is you know their facility was not built in order to. Uh, Intake a program like this, like most centers I visited, they had to get creative in how they would utilize additional space with lower numbers, um, but they do have a separate entrance. Again, it's a program that's utilized by their courts for young people who are 18 and under. Uh, not only, you know, it's referred through young people through uh, CYS as well as probation. Um, again, after school from, I believe, four to eight o'clock, they're picked up at school from this program. They received uh, services. A uh, plethora of services, more therapeutic during this time, and they're dropped off directly at their home. In summer, they're picked up at home and they're dropped off at the center. Um, so, with the dual purpose piece, um, you know, our priority is a secure aspect of it. Um, we're kind of looking at it as a two phase renovation. So, we want to make sure that uh, we advise the architect uh, to make sure that the secure aspect of our of our project is is done and renovated, uh, and then at a later time being able to incorporate this additional side is is what we hope for. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to turn it over to any of our subcommittee members who are here if they have any additional comments. Just want to make sure this reflects what we talked about. Um, and please add anything I missed. 
I would just add that uh, the tour that he had of the juvenile detention center today with the director um, um, and knowing some of this information was really, really very informative about what our present center is lacking and how it would need to be changed or modified to achieve the uh, goals that you have. Moving on, uh, I would defer to the rest of the boards in terms of any questions they have, any comments of what we discussed and what we've been discussing in our subcommittee. Uh, this is Elaine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, everyone. Um, just can you give us an update about where we are in the process of, you know, are there drawings? Are there preliminary drawings at this point? Or is that what happening is happening right now? And kind of what the timeline is? for moving forward with reconfiguring the space? Sure, so we spent, Councilman Shaver, we spent about two hours this morning with the architect. It was his first walkthrough to the building, right? Uh, as per his proposal, um, I think uh, we're looking at a four month timeline in order to have uh, some drawings and a plan and something before county council. So in four months, uh, uh, actual plan to approve? Correct. We're wow. looking at a timeline. We're looking at a timeline, hopefully a cost associated with it. And again, two phase. So we're going to start with the secure side, understanding that the county's priority is making sure we have some secure um, space for young people um, and then hopefully move on to the next piece. Yeah, so I guess for my part, um, I, I think there's a lot of great stuff in there, and I appreciate the work of the subcommittee and, and you and your, your teams, David. Um, I guess what comes up for me is the family and youth center, sure. community youth center it sounds really interesting, sure. um, but it also seems like a major sort of tack on to what the primary purpose of, uh, of this board is. Sure. Um, and, you know, it, it may be something that's needed within the community. Perhaps there are other already existing facilities in the county that, that do something like that, whether they're publicly mm -hmm. controlled or not. Um, but I, I really, my mind really focuses on the secure side first. Sure. Sure. And I think you said that, that this is really two phase. Yeah. Um, I would sort of use that, view that second phase as one where, you know, perhaps that makes sense. Perhaps it doesn't. Sure. We may have other um, more pressing needs for that part of the, the center that take precedent over it. Sure. But I, I just want to make sure that that sort of two phase approach doesn't in any way slow down what I think is far and away the most important part which is the secure side yeah um so that's that's my only comment is i really want to make sure that it's not in any way delaying what i think is you know a really thought a well thought out plan for the secure side and something that i think really reflects yeah, agree. Um, the desires of not just the subcommittee but the entire board i i don't want to speak for everyone but you know i think what i'm hearing here really mirrors a lot of what we've discussed here about what we want a secure setting to look like sure Yes. Yeah, I would just add back in. I just would love to add just having been around um, the justice system um, at multiple levels, especially the work that I did with PCCD. Um, I will tell you that the um, community side is extremely important if we are going to stop um, having to use the secure side so much. Um, if we don't, as a county, we don't, as a people, begin to recognize that we have young men and women and families that have trauma and have other needs, then we are going to continue to add beds and we're going to continue to have the same issues that we've always had. The studies around the country, if not around the world, have shown that if you have intervention prior to, if you have uh, a models that allow for uh, de escalation of of, of, um, of um, aggression, as well as the uh, ability for families to heal together from the trauma. Because remember this that when um, a young person commits a, um, any, well, anyone commits a, an issue, that it's not just that person or the victim that's being traumatized, it is the entire community that's being traumatized. And often we don't deal with the younger brother, younger sister, mom, dad, or whatever. And so it continues to perpetuate itself. So I would just say that certainly um, for us, us as this group, uh, we want, certainly want the secure side to be up in place so we don't have to keep doing stuff all over the county and all over the world. But 
both sides are equally, in my opinion, or both sides are equally important if we are going to turn the corner and really make Delaware County, I, I think, have Delaware County to be an opportunity to be a model um, of what um, correction could be uh, throughout throughout this area. So just if we keep them balanced, I think yeah, we'll do well. And you, you do not need to convince me of the importance of the diversionary aspect. I, I We've spoken about this at length for the last year about the importance. And I think we've arguably leaned to, in some of you too much into the diversionary side and not at the, the you know, the actual detention side. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm fully on board with what you're saying. I'm just saying, I don't know. And perhaps it's been done. Has there been sort of a study of what we have in existence around the county already? And if the answer is it does not exist and we need it to be here, then I'm on board with it. But I just think I, yeah, I don't so know. I think, that I think there are programs that are, and, and Judge Nichols can speak to this more than I would be able to. I think there are programs like, um, you know, Glen Mills and other places like that, that, um, that provide that service. The question would be, how does the council or how does the county want to partner with those types of institutions to make sure they have the resources that they need uh, to add to their programs? Mm -hmm. uh, because right now their, their programs are maxed and so the ability to do more means someone's have to someone's gonna have to pay more. So that's all. If we if we said that's the other part of it, and we have a rolling campus somewhere in mm -hmm. Delaware County that young people can do those services, that would be wonderful. But you know, we got to make sure they have the capacity to handle whatever's going to happen there. Yeah, I guess I'm just arguing that you know it's probably a second, separate project, right? To say what do we have available in the county. And what's the best way to advance from where we are today to where we want to be? And if it's to invest more heavily into a pre-existing organization that's a third party, let's do that. If it's to create our own freestanding, you know, community youth center that's attached to it, then let's do that. But I just I don't know that we've actually explored that in that way. Right. I think what the other thing would be that the, I the, want to jump in. That just we, we might have to one of the other things that we might need to look at is that again, as we're going back for licensure and things like that, there is a body that's going to look at what are we doing differently or what are we doing better um, as we are going back into this process. And so and so the ideal of adding some of these other elements to it may give us a leg up mm. and moving that process forward quicker. And so I don't know that to be, I don't know that, I don't know that's the, in the facts, somebody who does understands the legal piece of this would know that better. Um, but I can tell you that from meetings I've been in around the state, there's been much more favor given to organizations like Lancaster because of what they're doing versus other parts of the state that don't have that as part of their, their facilities and their working. So just something to keep, to keep in mind. I, I, I yeah, think you right. both make a very valid point. And because of that, I'm going to make the suggestion that our director talk to Director DiMatteo. We get every week who's been picked up and what the charges are. And I'm going to go back with some ancient history. I look at those and, and, and I get shocked because I see, wait a minute, how many people are charged with gun violence? And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe things haven't changed. Maybe that's the way it was 20 years ago. I don't know. But I think what we need to do is perhaps find out from De if she's if she would do that from De Director Di Matteo, what has she seen over time in terms of who are the youth that are getting arrested and brought into detention? Who are they? If, if there's a, if there's a picture that we see and there's a change, it may be that, that what he's proposed is absolutely right, or maybe that that's not enough that we need to do more. Mm -hmm. But I think when we start to do it without thinking about the youth who are coming in. We don't have any control over that. We can't say, well, I'd like somebody from Upper Darby and I'd like somebody from Chichester. No, we get whoever's arrested and whoever's brought in. And so Director DiMatteo, I'm putting you on the spot, may have a sense of what's happened over time. I know when I look at it and I see the gun charges, I think, my God, guns are everywhere. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. But I think that's what we ought to do, find out from her to get a sense of, where are we? Have things changed? Are we seeing more youth? And I'll be frank, are we seeing more minority youth? Are we seeing more females, whatever? So we get more of a sense of it. And that way, the proposals that you have could be adjusted and say, okay, we do need to have just what you've talked about, but we may find out 
there's more that's needed in there, or maybe less, I don't know, but I think she would give us a sense, if I haven't put the director on the spot, of what, what she's seen, what the statistics show of who's coming in. Yeah, facts. An overall picture. I think yeah. that would be helpful. Evidence um, sure. Yeah, we've got a couple of uh, board members that are virtual that I know want to chime in. Mr. Eisman, I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, I thought the concept and the design is, you know, and the thought that went into it is, is great and everything looks looks good. My only concern would be, I know you talked about not having the fence to make it look like a, a prison facility or a secure facility, but we have to make sure that the juveniles cannot escape out of that facility. That's why that fence was put in, you know, probably over 10 or 15 years ago because they had a big escape where four to five juveniles escaped out of the facility. So my concern would only be that. Other than that, I think everything looks good. Do you want to comment on that? Chief, thank you. And, you know, as always, I'm happy to take you down to the center and kind of walk through some of the operational kind of issues, which is why that fence is needed. Um, I think, you know, our redesign, uh, as well as, you know, partnership with Mr. Resnick and, and our, my director, Mr. Walker, we're able to address that um, to at least eliminate the fence um, in the initial phase. Yeah, so ha happy to walk you through there anytime, Chief. Yep. Ms. Ms. Williams, I think I see your hand in the air. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just, I, a couple of points. The first about, uh, you know, the population and recognizing the population that's coming into detention. I feel like uh, Director DiMatteo has given us full and complete information about who these young people are. And what I've seen from her weekly reports is that we're looking at uh, mostly young black males between 14 to 17. Um, either in possession of guns, involved in assaults, things of that nature. So I think we know who that population is. And further, I think this board has talked and retalked and retalked about the youth advocacy program. We got data from them that shows that they've had some success around the country in counties and places a lot more violent than Delaware County, dealing with exactly that population. So, so I feel like we've gotten a fair amount of data. I also recall the last meeting I was at that uh, Mr. Irizarry presented historical data about who was coming into detention in Delaware County and, and the nature of the charges that they were coming into the system with. So, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I don't feel like we need much more information on who these young people are. Um, but, you know, reasonable minds might differ on that. The second point I would make about the dual purposing of the uh, facility is that uh, we've also had presentations that show that this is pretty much, uh, you know, the state of, uh, you know, the best practices around juvenile detention in the country. Kids who go into juvenile detention have not been adjudicated for the most part, right? So they're just accused of having um, a, de a, a delinquent offense or having committed a crime. So it, even if you're not a juvenile justice expert, it just seems to make good common sense that at the point of, at which a young person has a contact with uh, the juvenile justice system, making intervention services available to that young person in a place that they are likely to be um, is, you know, it just seems to me to be intuitive that we would want to do that. So a kid who goes to detention may not be adjudicated delinquent, but that kid, we now know by virtue of their having been detained, is probably at much higher risk for future offending or uh, being adjudicated delinquent in the future. So to have services available on site for that young person and that family just makes a lot of sense, but but no one needs to listen to me. I mean, I think that um, you know, Mr. Irizarry has plenty of data to support that, and um, you know, perhaps he needs to present it in a more uh, comprehensive fashion. I think it's been pretty comprehensive, but you know, I would just speak in favor of of the dual purpose approach and um, and say that uh, you know, for other members of the board who who haven't heard of that approach. There are multiple, multiple examples that we can uh, bring to the broader board and to the public to support uh, that approach. Just real quick, I don't think anybody in the board doesn't want that dual approach. I think that's great. I think Kevin's point to the matter was just that we need to move forward with getting the secure facility first where we can house our, our juveniles. And then once that's done, then we can move on to that dual approach. 
I agree that there is nowhere else in Delaware County. Glen Mills isn't dealing with them. They're in the same boat we are. They don't have a they don't have a license. So I mean, there's nowhere else to send these kids. If there's somewhere where they they can go after school to get help or you know to get counseling, I think that's a great idea. I hear you, Chris, and I think I think though that that maybe what what we may need to do is is you know be a little bit more descriptive about what the dual purpose means. So it would be a single facility, right? It's not. It's not that the detention side would be delayed because we're doing, um, you know, a nice touchy feely family room instead. It, these things would be happening concurrently, and they would work hand in hand, is my understanding. But I, I'll leave it to um, Mr. Irizarry to, to so speak. That, that, Judge Nichols, did you? Yeah, if I, Marie, if I could respond, I, I think I probably didn't make myself as clear as I should have. When we talk about juveniles who are detained, it does not necessarily mean that it's their first charge. It doesn't mean it's their second charge. It could be that the young person was out on probation, et cetera, et cetera, and violated probation. What I'm asking for is to get a better picture from the director as to the history, so to speak, of most of the youth who are coming in. Um, and if most of them are coming in, it's the first charge and it's serious and that's why they're there. But my experience has been, if it's not a very serious charge, they're not detained. They're sent home. It's typically when they violate probation or they violate the monitor or et cetera. And so I, I think we need to get a bigger picture of who these youth are. And, and Director DiMatteo may say, 70% of them who come in uh, already have been adjudicated, have had probation, have been in front of a judge several times and they've been warned, et cetera. So just so we get a better picture and that would just better help us serve the needs of those in individuals who do come into detention. That's what I was trying to say. David Thank Johnson. you for that clarification. Yeah, and look, I mean, what I'm hearing just to kind of maybe put a, a bow on this conversation is um, consensus, if not unanimous consensus about the importance of both the, the secure and non-secure side. And I think I also don't hear anyone objecting to the fact that um, we don't want to shorten or not shorten, but lengthen the time frame on getting the secure side up and running. Um, and that, you know, the non-secure side, that that other, whether it's in Lima or it's somewhere else, that's up for further exploration. And, and perhaps the right place absolutely is Lima. I'm not saying it isn't, but um, let's just look at that as a separate and distinct element to the secure side, which it sounds like we're moving forward with. Yep. And I mean, my, my last comment is, you know, every center I visited, uh, every director I talked to has a plethora of experience with, longer than mine, 20 plus years, talked about detention kind of being a, a dying breed and how the national reform and, and the way that the vision of detention is going is, you know, all these facilities are looking at additional ways um, to utilize their facility because of what it costs the county as opposed to how many young people are in these facilities. Um, I think this, again, gives us a step to be a uh, step ahead. Of, uh, of other counties who are going through the planning process now, uh, as well as allows us to look 20 years into the future. Um, if, if, you know, if this field isn't gonna exist, you know, um, you know, what's the use of a Lyman facility? And I think it's, it gives us an opportunity to be proactive, um, whether it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a community center, whether it's emergency shelter for young people, whether it's transitional housing for that 18 to 21 kind of youth, um, that there's a lack of that kind of nationally. I think we have to get creative in terms of, um, what we do with that additional campus space. Great. Thank you, David. No worries. So move, moving on uh, to the next agenda item, Sean, if you can. Uh, um, so I was I was able to submit to you all um, somewhat of a, a of a budget for next year, um, understanding that it, it essentially is a placeholder budget. Um, but I wanted to get your all feedback in terms of what I submitted um, in detail, uh, get your feedback going forward. Now, I'll give a kind of general overview of what I submitted. Um, so we submitted a budget of uh, 6.1, a little bit over 6.1 million with uh, 2.4 uh, of that being dedicated toward personnel. Uh, also want to note that last time the center was fully operational, um, this, this, the budget for salary was around 3.9 um, million. Um, and then additional operational cost of around 3.7 with a um, little bit over half a million dollars for one-time kind of expenses. And within that contract of services, um, we have to contract for medical, for food, for education, for program for young people, um, a lot of general placeholders. 
Um, also want to give some context. We were asked to submit this budget closer to July to our budget director. Um, there were so many unknown, so many unknowns around that time. Um, a lot of placeholders. Uh, just wanted to get your feedback. Next slide, please. As we look at kind of analysis of what the county has uh, spent historically on the detention center. Uh, so in the yellow is what the ex expenditures have been. Uh, in the blue is what uh, the state has reimbursed us through the Act 148 funding. Um, you can see from uh, 2021 and 2022, very little expenditures, um, whether that's a great thing or not, um, to show some savings. And then uh, the very last would be our projections for 2023 um, and also a projection of maybe 1.5 million reimbursed from the state. Next slide. Uh, a couple points of emphasis. Um, again, you know, this budget was drafted around July. Um, I'm looking for your input. Just, you know, it hasn't been finalized. Want some feedback. Um, I have to review this budget with our executive director and I have a meeting set up with our budget director um, next Wednesday, uh, the 25th. Um, we can revisit this uh, at the September meeting once we have a little bit more actuals. Um, and again, uh, this budget has to be submitted and finalized to our executive director by the first week of October. Just looking for any feedback in terms of what I submit. And again, uh, full transparency, I submitted uh, the detailed budget to you all via email for you all to review. David, can we go back to the actual slide with the... Sure. Uh, can I ask why the state reimbursement number for 2023 is so low comparatively to the history? Sure. So it, it's normally reimbursed at the 50% uh, rate. Um, our budget reflects uh, being fully staffed um, six months into the calendar year. Um, and with that being said, you know, it's an assumption that we're fully open and operational by next July. Um, with that being said, it, that's half of a fiscal year. Therefore, it's a quarter of a reimbursement, if that makes any sense. Can you go to the prior slide that had more detail down there? Yeah. So you see the increase of staff uh, from, you know, our department now has only three members uh, increasing from three to 51. Um, we used uh, Bucks County's, um, you know, we cross compared to Bucks County, who was the only center we visited that wasn't in a crisis staff, staff is a staff uh, crisis. Um, and their director dedicated a lot toward the way they paid their staff um, that ranged from 21 to 20, $28 an hour for their direct support child care workers. So the 50% reimbursement is 50% is of what? 50% of costs associated with the center, predominantly uh, staff. A, a lot of the staff uh, needed to run a center is state mandated. Therefore, mm -hmm. I believe that's why uh, they support and that number 51, you don't anticipate being having that staff until mid-year. Yeah, we hope to. Um, it's all based off of our architect's timeline. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, if he's saying we're open by July, we would like probably three or four months prior to to start uh, recruiting, identifying those. We're going to, you know, per state requirements, there's 40 hours of training. We're probably going to require uh, a month or two of training. Um, and a lot of those trainings are associated with our contractor services as well. Just in terms of you know, trauma-informed services, conflict mediation, these are all things that aren't required by the state, but I would like our staff to be uh, trained in these matters as well. And does that goal of a timeline match potentially the, the earliest we could get our license back and, and actually serve these children? Right. So the application is submitted. Mm -hmm. um, again, our architect is key just in terms of letting us know what that potential time look, uh, timeline looks like. Uh, and I'm going to make sure our timeline uh, for our first site visit um, is, 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 is directly correlated with the timeline that the secure project um, is going to be complete. I wouldn't advise having the state come out prior to um, we, us having that timeline, those plans. Um, just wouldn't make any sense if that makes any sense. So am I understanding that our staff has to be trained and in place before we get our license back? No. No, just. No, I mean, our, we can receive a license technically without having staff. It can be part of our, uh, our onboarding plan, right? The stat, you know, their site visit is going to really look at um, the physical center. 
Oh, okay. And is is it, is it able to the program able to run tomorrow if we had the staff needed? Okay. And again, the application is submitted. We'll be assigned somebody from the Southeast region, and him or her is going to be able to have the answers to these questions directly because you know that's kind of what a site inspector uh, does. Yes, Ms. Fulmer Townsend. One of the things that I noticed, unless I'm, I hope I'm looking at the most recent version of this, is this is a, for a 66 bed facility. But I thought when we looked at the um, numbers in that comprehensive presentation that um, Ms. Williams spoke of earlier, that we talked about having less beds than, than this before. I, I don't remember the number that we, we talked about, but 66 seems to be more than what we talked about or at least more than what i remember so i just wanted to ask about that no this this is based off a 24 bed model which is so you, you know I'm um, sure column yeah. G, um at least on the one that i'm looking for it says budget 66 beds total for 2023 66 beds am i reading that incorrectly yeah so i think we have to get you the most updated version miss townsend Okay, this yeah. one says 815, so I thought yeah, I would have it. may have been a column that was hidden, but we'll we'll update it. But this is based off a 24-bed facility. Okay, thank you. For yep, no worries. So basically you're saying, if I understand this correctly, the state, for all intents and purposes, will reimburse you for the staff. Um, it's the other, op and the county will take care of the other operational pieces. If you're, if you're just looking at it, if the state is doing, if the budget is... 6.1, our staff is 24, the state does half of the 61, so basically 3 million of it is gonna be covered. The staff portion is covered by the state, the other portion is covered by the county. And so we looked at traditional numbers that Act 148 grant was funding half of what uh, the county had to pay for detention. Okay. Um, in terms of this budget, we, bu we budgeted off of um, staff um, a six months, right? Six months into the year, therefore um, a quarter of, of reimbursement, if that makes any sense. So is this being conservative or is this being aggressive? Well, just to, just to make sure we're clear on the your question though, the state reimburses us for local detention costs, right? For right. which we have six months of that. Correct. So it's not half of 6.1 million. It's a quarter. It's half of 2.4 million. The half of three point five, so it's the, and what's it, what's included in the three point five? It's the two point four one nine plus what? What is it? It's it's predominantly I think the staffing. Is that is that correct, person? Staffing levels. So staffing is two point four two million, right? Yeah. And what percentage does the state reimburse us for? 50%, but we're basing off a quarter of, of, of what it is. So we budgeted for, and again, I'll, I'll make sure we have some of the exact numbers, but again, we looked at six, so we looked at six months. So total expenditures was at 6.1. We looked at half of that, which is around three point, uh, about 3 million, and then 1.54 is what we expected being reimbursed. Oh, so maybe I was confused. So yeah. 6.1 million is, is a full year of 24 beds. No, no, it's a full year of our budget, right? Um, with hoping that as of July 1, the center will be open. So this is, the state isn't going to reimburse until a young person resides at the center, if that makes any sense. I think so. I mean, contracted look, services is, is primarily for the first half of the year when, when we're not locally staffed per this budget. Second, yeah, second, second half of, of the calendar year. Beginning so of the, the fiscal line year. items on here that would get reimbursed by the state for 50% would be the personnel costs plus what else? Uh, Other operating office program supplies. We believe the contract of services as well. So medical. Uh, oh, so contracted services isn't just outside detention services. This is No, these are, these are the subcontracts that we have to bring in the center in order to provide the services. So yeah, so it's, a, it's medical, a mixed bag of correct. things. Some of which would be reimbursed by state, correct. some of which would not be. Correct. Okay. So it. this budget obviously doesn't detail that, but the budget I sent to the board has it specific does. areas yeah. in which uh, we accounted for some funding. Okay, I'm sorry, Reverend. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to no, make no, sure we no, I, no, I had clarity to, on your question. I was, trying to, I was trying to process it in my head to make sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that, I mean, that X48 piece and that needs-based piece is, is something that we're learning as we go. We rely heavily on uh, Chief DiMatteo as well as uh, Children and Youth Services to kind of help us through that process. And we're learning it, but uh, this is our understanding. Okay. Any other questions from board members on the on the uh, draft budget? Yes. Uh, does this budget comprise just juvenile detention or does that also include the juvenile kitchen, which I think used to be separate? Kitchen is included. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, was a budget workbook completed? And if so, would, that might make it a little bit easier for us if you we were right. It was, to it, the board. It, it was submitted to Mr. Hayes, a budget director, okay. back in July, and we're having our second rounds of kind of cleaning it up, and I have to meet with our executive director as well. So this is a, this is a preliminary kind of uh, you know high level draft. Uh, just wanted to get the board's feedback before we move forward with meeting with the powers to be. And my last question was just, I just noticed there's a few items um, that appear to be capital, um, like maintenance for the HVAC. Um, there's an item mentioning equipment, uh, electronic medical equipment. Was that included in the, on the capital request budget? Yeah, we, 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 we didn't submit any of that stuff. Um, I know Danielle has, has a capital request for the renovation. Okay. Understanding that we're going to have facilities like medical, we looked at maybe renting out equipment like x-ray or things of that nature. Again, all unknowns to us at this point, um, we just wanted to have a, not, a line item to make sure we had everything we need to go um, to press play when, when, when we need to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else on the board on the uh, draft budget? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. All right. Um, any old business from the board? Any new business? If not, we'll move on to our last round of public comment. Anyone from the public who would like to address the board? And when you're speaking, please start with your name and your address, and please um, limit your comments to three minutes. Hi, my name's Sarah Caulfield. I'm at 736 Hemlock Road in Media, and what I've written or prepared for today has changed a bit, as I'm very glad to hear that the um, initial stage of the application process is in effect. Um, I hope that that goes forward um, smoothly. So I'm just going to read what I have to write, because it's been a long time for me to wait to say this. Um, three minutes is a very short time. I know last uh, meeting, the courageous citizens who got up and spoke and shared their stories were afforded a bit more time. And if I go over, I hope you can afford me the same grace. I resigned as intake supervisor from Delaware County Juvenile Court and Probation Services as, as of July 14th. Please know my resignation had nothing to do with the horrific detention, detention situation. Pre previously, I was on the board I, I'm sorry, previously I was told the board's only views, the only views staff, I'm sorry, previously I was told the board's only views staff's concerns regarding close of Lima's complaints were seen as complaints as additional work. While the closing has certainly caused more work, stripping away time from clients and adding more stress to a high emotion job, it has significantly impacted the resources of CYS, the police, the sheriffs, youth centers in Pennsylvania, community-based providers, and even a local hospital. However, more work is the least of my concerns. First and foremost, to any youth abused while at Lima or any juvenile facility, I'm genuinely sorry for what you suffered, and I wish you healing. For the perpetrators of those wrongdoings, shame on you, and I hope you're prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I am not about locking kids up. I am for further reform. I am for pre preventative measures. However, until we live in a world where children are not born into trauma and learn to value life, until youth are not living in gun-filled streets and in inherit, with an inherent need to protect themselves and therefore carry and use guns themselves, until we no longer have youth sexually abusing other children, until your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, your sibling can go to the store without getting carjacked or beaten for more than a cell phone, this is uh, until we until we live in utopia. My concern is that we do need a youth center. We need a youth center not only for the safety of the victims in the community. We need it for the safety and well-being of the youth adjudicated or alleged to have committed these types of offenses so we can assess and plan for these youth. I echo Ms. Keenan's past comment that the staff at Juvenile Court of Probation Services 
juvenile court and probation services deeply care about and are highly dedicated to the youth with whom we, they work. Their critical role related to the youth is to provide re rehabilitation treatment and supervision. This cannot happen when kids don't have the security of a center, have cut the GPS and run. These are the kids at highest risk who desperately need help, yet they cannot receive it because we do not have beds available. As a supervisor with the closing of Lyme, multiple parents begged me to find a bed for their child, knowing that he or she would, would not abide by a GPS, knowing their child is not safe in abandoned houses, and knowing that the community is not safe with their child out there untreated, unsupervised, and not rehabilitated. To those parents, I am deeply sorry that I could not do my job and protect your children. To the victim of those youth, I am sorry I could not offer you a sense of protection. And to the community as a whole, I'm sorry I could not help to keep our neighborhood safe. For nearly a year and a half, the department has literally been begging for beds and hoping for best, the best otherwise. In the unlikely event a bed is secured, the department is forced to make heart-wrenching decisions as to who gets the bed, which kid is in most need, which kids are less likely to cut and run. Kids are moved around like pawns on a chessboard. While it's disturbing, dangerous, and wrong, I wish it was simply a game of chess. Unfortunately, that Unfortunately, what the department is forced to play is Russian roulette with our youth and community, the targets. As a concerned parent of a delinquent youth, they asked this board previously, what is it going to take? Thank you for your time, and I hope things continue to move forward. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Craig Caulfold, um, Sarah's husband, also at 736 Hemlock Road in Media. Um, also a 25-year veteran teacher in Delaware County, um, high school and youth coach as well uh, for 25 years. Um, again, I'll echo the sentiments. I uh, appreciate all the work that was put into um, what looked like or looks like everything is heading in the right direction in terms of reopening the youth center. Um, but I too will continue with um, what we had previously written. Uh, watching my wife struggle with the hours upon hours she has worked after hours and on call and a witness to the emotional strain not having an attention center has had on her and her colleagues. I never understood how the public is not more enraged, pressing for a center. It was not until I watched the board meetings that I realized that the public is not being informed of the reality of the circumstances. Without this information, there has been no sense of urgency from the greater public pressed upon this board to get its attention center running. There has been minimal news coverage. I believe this to be the case because the only information presented at these meetings is the number of kids in detention at that very moment, painting a very blurred vision of the reality, a picture painted for everyone, un anyone unfamiliar with the juvenile justice system as if everything is under control. We have three kids in detention, period, the end. What we are not being told, as was asked previously by another citizen, is the number of beds searched for but unable to secure, putting offenders back on the streets, the seriousness of the offenses involved, the de delinquency history of the youth, the number of direct files who have been released as on a GPS, the kids who get released because a borrowed bed is suddenly needed by the lending county. Nor is the public, me included, aware of how many bench warrants are issued because a kid cut and ran, often reoffending while living an unsafe life on the streets. I've heard multiple times the board is not here to be interrogated, if we are not able to get answers here, where can the public go to be informed? Well, I'm not sure why the license was allowed to lapse given Delaware County is a class 2A county and per statute 23391, we are required to have a detention center. I'm very glad to hear the license application was finally submitted. And obviously, as we've heard tonight, um, the ball is hopefully rolling in that direction uh, with getting approval. Moving forward, knowing the license can take upwards of nine to 12 months to be approved, I implore this board to do anything and everything in your power to get a safe, trauma-focused center up and running as soon as possible. Until this happens, we continue to put our youth, victims, and the community at risk. We are also draining resources that could and should be used toward preventative measures and developing accessible, impactful resources to develop for our youth so they can learn their self-worth supporting them through their journey to become productive citizens. Until Delaware County has a youth center, we are neglecting our highest at-risk youth and failing the community as a whole. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Colleen Kennedy, 8723 Westchester Pike. I'm at this meeting today to ask you to take a step back and deeply reflect on the moment we are all in and what is truly possible, because that is not what I believe is currently being pursued. 
Moving forward with a plan to renovate a facility where children were abused is not only not cost-effective, it's not trauma-informed. If I'm wrong, let's start having these meetings there. Soft colors and impact-resistant glass are not a sincere effort at being trauma-informed. Moving forward with a plan that increases the potential for occupancy to 20 kids or even more is not meeting this moment. It is doubling down on what caused this crisis in the first place, the caging of kids instead of addressing the mistakes of adults. The referrals by a school or a probation officials only replicate the biases and structural oppression that already exist. Pursuing generational decisions while multiple rounds of civil litigation remain pending is not taking this responsibility seriously and failing to include the voices and concerns of kids directly impacted by all of this is an insult to the entire county and to those kids trauma. The promises of, an, of on site services were promises made before, and it took years and countless victims to catch on to the failure to meet this mandate. I want to be abundantly clear here. Our county cannot defend itself against civil litigation while making decisions on this issue because each and every decision will be clouded by the fear of incrimination. But even if that wasn't the case, we still shouldn't be pursuing this plan to open up a detention center at Lima. Part of being a leader is being willing to admit when something is wrong and actually learn. The actions of this board in recent months, as well as the planned framework itself, prove that is not happening in any way, shape, or form. You are not alone in navigating these struggles. Just the other day, I was reading on Twitter the story of what is happening in Atlanta, Georgia, as we speak. A prison was proposed for closure as a campaign promise. It closed only to be reopened as a rental opportunity for the county level incarceration needs. This facility, for an infinitesimal moment, was going to maybe be the John Lewis Center for Health and Wellness. And in a political instant, that dream was abandoned because decision makers failed to imagine what was politically possible or necessary. We are the county that created its first ever Department of Health during a pandemic. Let's remember who we are. It is time for us to stop re reacting out of fear and start making thoughtful decisions that address the root causes of kids being led astray. A complete lack of mental health access, a lack of equitable opportunities for youth empowerment, and unaddressed impacts of poverty. Let's be the regional leaders that I know we are capable of being. The money you'll spend resurrecting a building filled with horrors could be spent ensuring every single kid in Delaware County gets counseling, or ensuring that mental health crisis workers go to every domestic violence call, or ensuring that every single teen in Delaware County has a free SEPTA pass so they can have more job opportunities. I'm not the naive one because after all, during this time of closure, you've done without a facility like this. And the last thing I'll just say is that I actually have close family members, as well as multiple classmates and friends who I still know to this day who have been in facilities like this. And I wonder if any of our, our county council members have that same experience while they're making these decisions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Pastor Jay Harrison, 919 Elsnor Place, Chester, PA. Standing here before you first to say thank you to the advisory board for and to the head of the juvenile uh, detention uh, probation office for uh, hearing my plea. Constantly, I've come before this board, uh, contrary to, to some believe that we don't need a detention center. And by all means, we're going to be having a town hall meeting at my church. And when it's set, I'm going to invite you, those of you that want to come, it's going to be uh, youth some of the very youth that we're talking about, uh, to hear from the young people. Some of these young people, uh, we're trying to work out some uh, parlay, if you will, or, or sort of like a uh, with their probation officer, uh, hear us. I know you're, you're trying to catch us type of deal, but hear us because I'm, I'm communicating. Listen, we don't have a facility, but I had two boys who needed to be uh, in detention to save their lives because they had run the mill. They wouldn't listen at home. They wouldn't listen at school. They wouldn't listen to the police. They wouldn't listen to the probation officer. And one's now uh, getting help. Uh, it's a long road, but he's, he's realizing every other day I need help. Uh, his brother, because he's getting help, is realizing maybe I need to change some, some of the decisions that I'm making so I don't end up uh, in, in the detention center, we need a center. One of the things that I want to do as part of the community is bring the young people together. Uh, 
at 701 Morton Avenue, and I'll be coming out here to invite you uh, when we can assure. And it doesn't take 30 you, but a good handful of young people just to sit and listen. And, and you know, um, I heard someone say about some of their horror and their pains. Here's some of the stories that they had when they were in detention, but then also some of the things that they think the detention centers, the local police officers, the pro probation officers need to do uh, in the meantime, while we don't have a facility to help them. Um, this putting on a monitor and they're cutting it off. They said, okay, isn't insanity doing the same thing over and again? Yes, cutting it off might be insanity on their part, but it's also on our part to keep putting one on there. They said, we've got to come up with something different. And, um, you know, something to do. So we're trying to do those things. I don't want to run out of time by, by, by babbling, but one of the things I want to do is offer uh, part of the solution is to bring young people together and possibly uh, let you all hear from them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And when you have more information about the, the event, please let us know. Any other members of the public would like to speak? Hello, uh, Ashley Dalsamore. I have to give my address. Please. 1151 Oakwood Drive, Darby Township. So I just have a few, uh, actually a lot of thoughts about reopening uh, the juvenile detention center. So I'm just going to um, rattle off a few concerns. Um, first of all, the money that it would take um, to rehab old pipes, electric could be spent on, on, it would be, it would be more cost effective to just make a new place if that's what you were going to do. But I, I am not a fan of that idea at all. Um, but even considering reopening the old place, um, that is full of ghosts and children were traumatized there. Um, at the very least, I think that's, I'm um, just a poor decision to make. Um, and to plan for at least 20 beds, like it just raises the question of like, why? Um, there were four children there when it shut down. The average daily population was less than 10. So why aim for at least 20 beds? Because then there's going to be the want to fill those beds when we shouldn't even be considering this at all. That money, whatever money is going to be used for this needs to be used to for preventative measures. So Delaware County is pretty scarce as far as like mental health resources go. And I know this firsthand because my family member who is a minor needed help. And I had to jump through hoops of fire. I had to drive her out of state actually to get her help. Not that that place was any better because it was pretty much like a jail um, as well. Um, but that's a whole nother topic of the proper way to run, um, whether it be a shelter. There's no use shelters in Delaware County. Um, where are the mental health resources, specifically for children in Delaware County? I mean, the kids out here, the kids that I know, the kids that reach out to me and the families that reach out to me for help all say the same thing is that everybody's on a wait list of like a year long. People don't take their insurance. Thankfully, last time I was here, actually, there was a man here coming um, for something else, but he overheard me um, talking about how I'm, I'm trying to get my niece uh, help. And he was here. Um, and he's who got me contacted with somebody and now she's seeing someone. Um, but that was like a lucky rare case. Like there's a lot of families I know who want to get their children help and they can't. And so instead of like planning on putting children in cages, why don't we think about how we can prevent that from happening? And why don't we take that money and pour it into them when they're young, help families who may not be able to afford health insurance and co-pays. Like why, I'm sorry, but like, it, has that not went through anybody's mind? Like we need to take this money and we need to put it into the community and we need to actually genuinely help. Let's get to the root of the problem instead of like taking all of this money to revamp something that was closed because children were abused and traumatized there. Like, I just don't see the sense in that. And I know I'm not only speaking for myself, I'm speaking for a lot of people who are not able to make it today, but at the very least it's enraging. 
Um, and I don't know if any of you have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews who have ever needed like real sincere trauma informed care and real help, but it's not a fun time. And it's really horrible living in a county where it's, I mean, we just got our health department because of COVID that should have been, that should have been done already. So again, let's not try to like bypass the root causes of these issues and ignore them because that's showing that you don't care about the children at all. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? All right, hearing none, um, board member comments. Yeah, just real quick, uh, Mr. Mann, I'd like to thank Superintendent Arizari. He took time out of his schedule last month, to come down to the eastern part of the county and speak to several police chiefs, specifically in Darby Barrow, Falkroft, and that area. And, you know, they heard him, they explained to him what the problems are. And uh, it was very informative. So I'd like to thank him for that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chris. Hope to be back soon. Absolutely. Another thing, I just think it, to be fair to all those employees who once worked at the detention center, it's important to note that no one has been arrested or charged as of today's date. So I hear a lot of talk of all these atrocities that took place at the facility and, you know, this happened, that happened. Well, there's a lot of good people that work there. So to be fair to the staff that once worked there, I think you should reserve judgment until the attorney general comes out with his report and says something did happen or didn't happen or if someone is arrested. I'm not saying something didn't happen, but I think to be fair to the employees that work there, they're being put in a negative light. I have a question for just clarification. When we talk about new employees and recruitment, would that mean that these employees would be county employees or if they're state, if it's state funded, is there a different funding source or regulatory staffing? Yes, yeah, so all staff and staff would be Delco employees. Would be Delco employees. Correct. And we've um, brought to the table is that, you know, certainly cleared by the AG that we would recruit and post um, for those folks that have been without a job and have an interest in serving our youth. Yeah, I, I was always clear from day one in right. terms of uh, everybody's eligible to apply, right? Nobody's guaranteed a job. You have to sure. through the interview process and make sure they align with our new vision. And, you know, we encourage anybody uh, who's interested in working with kids to apply. Thanks. Comments from the board? Um, for my part, uh, and this is somewhat of a repeat of comments I've made in months past, but um, as we heard tonight, there is obviously a lot of um, intense feelings uh, across the spectrum of how people perceive detention. Um, we've heard from folks tonight who you know, have spoken with great passion about why um, there is a need for detention and why it's a disservice to certain youth who um, aren't put in a confined setting for their own safety and for the community's safety. And we've heard others who have spoken about it in terms of putting kids in cages. And, you know, I, I think what I would ask the public is to give this board a chance and remember that this board never oversaw a detention facility at Lima or otherwise. That what may or may not have occurred in Lima um, predates this board. It predates the management that's been hired to oversee it. And so, you know, comments about those walls being filled with ghosts, I don't believe in ghosts. And if they exist, we will exercise the ghosts. Um, but allow this board to put forth something that can be a model for what detention may look like for this country. Um, because it, you know, we, we don't have to be beholden to what four walls used to look like in the past. Um, that's all I have to say to it. But again, I, I do appreciate the deeply emotional concerns that folks have on the side of the need for detention and this, the side that detention historically in this country has looked a lot like putting kids in cages, which I have sympathy for. Yeah, just I just wanted to add one thing. Just uh, it was piggyback off one of the young ladies who was sitting back there and uh, off of uh, Pastor here uh, in regards to the voices of the children. I'm not sure at what place and, you know, or how we can go about doing this. Certainly that was, it's awesome what you're 
attempting to do, but even prior to, I think that being a part of what's going on um, would be, you know, even if it was, you know, folks that have been involved before, uh, getting their voices is probably paramount uh, because they can speak for other young people that have not been in the system and maybe help us to keep them out. So uh, I love that idea. Thank you for thinking about it. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, and thank you for saying it, the young lady in the back. Uh, thank you for for making that comment because it's it it is uh, definitely a missing piece. And one last thing I'd like to point out is we spent a good amount of the time of today's meeting talking about trauma informed care outside of detention. Um, the Reverend spoke at length about the desire to make this a dual purpose facility, as did Mr. Arizari. Um, for folks who came in late into the meeting and didn't hear that, I'd encourage you to, to listen to the, the actual comments of the meeting. Um, anything else from the board for this evening? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good night.